I'm Gary Wirtle. I'm the CEO and senior analyst of a new consulting company called i5 Research. For the past four years, until February 1st, I was a senior analyst at Brandon Hall Research. And if you're in the corporate training field, you probably know the Brandon Hall name. And on February 1st, they merged with another company called AC Growth, and they've sort of gone a little sideways in terms of their direction, which is now about sales training and talent management. <coughs> so I've moved on. Got lots of projects, and I'm very happy to be here, and thank you to Float for inviting me. And uh, one of the reasons I, I know that uh, I started a conversation with Chad uh, was that I wrote this book last year, it came out in September, and he did a review of it, and we've been back and forth. And so on. So I do have a book out on mobile learning. It's one of the two books. The other one's actually here that I reviewed on my website for the book by Clark Quinn. So there really are two books on the use of mobile learning that are out right now. There's a few other academic books out from Europe, but these are the two main ones that are out for people specifically in the corporate enterprise training field. And the website, by the way, has a lot of other things like resources and uh, other publications that I've done. I like to start with this quote. <coughs> and uh, the reason I do is because many of us, <coughs> myself included, are technophiles. We love this stuff. We love it. We love all the gears and the, the gadgets and all those things. And it's fun to figure out how everything works. But you actually don't necessarily need mobile learning. And the first message I would want to give to you is that if you're considering mobile learning, you need to ask the question, why? And if you don't have a good answer, don't go and buy a bunch of iPads, right? But that's what people are doing right now. Companies are just going by a pile of smartphones or tablets, or they're saying, okay, let's just build an app. And then we say, well, why? So you don't need to do this. People do like to be on the leading edge, but it's not necessary. And I think that's comforting for those of you who feel kind of pressured that this is the latest thing and you've got to do it just because it's the latest thing. Don't. No. You've got to have good reasons. And so what I do actually in my work now is I work with companies on strategy. Because you need to know the why, and you also need to know what you're in for. What are the decision points? What are all the steps you have to take? I've got a, a roadmap right now of 46 points where you make decisions, and depending on what decisions you make, you may go this way or that way, and it has implications down the road. So that's really important. But we're here today to talk about the future, and talk a little about the past, the present, and the future, but the emphasis is going to be on the future. And there are at least three ways of predicting the future. One is to uncover hidden developments or innovations that are out there already. Second is to take trends and patterns that we know occur over and over again and project them into the future. And the third is simply to invent the future. <coughs> Let's take a quick look at each of these. William Gibson, who coined the term cyberspace, said that the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. And what he means by that is that much of what you're going to see in the next, say, five years is already been developed. You just don't know about it. In fact, I may know about it, and you don't know about it. So my present may be very different than your, or maybe the same as your future, and it may be very different than your present. And I know I meet people now, and I met some people the other day from the city of Toronto, and they're looking at, should we have an LMS or not, a learning management system or not? I'm saying, like, that's 10 years old, that question at least, maybe, maybe more. But that's where they're at. And for them to talk about some of the things that are happening in mobile learning, they're not there yet. They're not ready for it. So you have to realize that each of us has a different future in terms of technology. But all technologies have a development curve. They just don't, they're not like uh, they're hatched out of an egg and all of a sudden they're there. Although it seems fast, even something like an iPod will have several years of development behind it. The idea will have been there for a long time. Okay. So one of the things I do is I work on trying to discover that hidden present and past that really is the future, because we haven't heard about it, but it's out there and being developed already. So we look a bit about how technologies develop. We find that over this end, 
there are people working on innovations and new ideas all the time. Okay? But at some point, it becomes a tipping point where this starts to take off and people start to commercialize it, use it, talk about it. And all of a sudden we say, well, that's brand new. But really, this could have been 20 or 30 or 40. In the case of fax machine, it was about almost 100 years. It was the 1920s, I believe, that they thought of how to do a fax machine, 1960s, before it really took over. Took over. So maybe uh, uh, 40 or 50 years before that really became dominant. So there's a development curve that's out there. And not everything that's being worked on here actually takes off. So again, you have to know the factors that may make that happen. <coughs> now the next thing that happens with the technology is that Okay, let's say we all get excited about mobile learning. The next thing we see is what I call proliferation of product offerings. And that's where we're at with mobile right now. In fact, Josh this morning you know, really told us what a huge <coughs> set of choices there are out there. And all the different things, and, and uh, Kevin showed us the same thing. All the different devices that we have. And that's a normal stage of te technology development. So you, you should expect that. When the automobile was invented, there was about 150 car companies in North America. Then it settled down to the big three or the big four. Right? So that, that's to be expected. Then we hit something called a dominant design. The dominant design is when people settle into a certain model of how things are done. And that's really where we're at, that all these companies are scrambling to have their device, their ideas to be the dominant designs. Once it settles down, the studies show that then the number of firms drops off drastically and quite quickly. And it settles down to the dominant players. And there's usually one dominant player. You know who number two is. You may or may not know number three, but after that, we really don't care. But that's a stage, and we're not there yet in terms of mobile. We're at this proliferation of product offerings. Once we have a dominant design, then innovation slows down and becomes incremental then we get small changes. And we run that out as long as we're making money. Now, this is all written about in, the, in a great book that I recommend called The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. He shows that how in the hard disk industry, that remember the hard disk, we had big giant ones, first, you know, and then they came down to size, we had different gradations. What he shows is in his study that whoever was the leader at that level, in that particular size of hard drive, was not usually the leader of the next generation. It was a new car. And that's the innovator's dilemma. The innovator's dilemma is do we continue to work on our incremental changes and continue to make money, or do we start a new disruptive pro uh, project that's going to actually cannibalize our profit, perhaps, and start us off in a new direction or spend a lot of money, it's so-called leading edge. But if you do that, you may very, very well be the leader in the next generation. <coughs> That's the dilemma. Do you want to be the leader in the next generation, or do you want to just continue to do what you're doing and make money? Now, what happens is that when you're in the business of producing a product and you're making a lot of money, down the road comes social change or comes product change or whatever kind of change is going to hit you. The question is, what do you do about it? And those companies that are making money tend to just tinker with their product and try to make it better. They don't necessarily make a new paradigm. They don't necessarily make a new a set of disruptive technologies. What they do is they tinker with it. They add features. They bolt on this or do that. My favorite example of that is the ice merchants in upper and in New England, who would cut the ice of the lakes in New Hampshire and Vermont and ship it down by train to uh, New York City for ice boxes, so people would put the ice in their ice boxes. They came along this thing called refrigeration. So the ice manufacturers, said the first reaction of people when they find a new technology coming along is, ah, that's never going to work. So there's lots of examples of that where people say, and my, my favorite is at and actually looked at the Inter well, is now the internet, but looked at computer networking for six months and gave it back to DARPA saying, well, there's no use for this. <laughs> that was 1970. They had six months of testing it, gave it back, said, no, no use. But the ice merchants, what they did is they, they thought, okay, these new fangled refrigerators, how are we going to combat 
that threat. So they made new improved ice. And the new improved ice was before they would have horses drag the ice in, on sleds off the lake and, and then hoist it on the trains. The new improved ice is they put bags under the horse's ass to catch stuff so that the, night, the, the ice was now cleaner. <laughs> Apparently it didn't stop refrigeration. Okay? But you see there's a pattern here. And we start looking at patterns in history. And we do have some ideas, at least there's theories, of how this technology develops. And so if we're going to predict the future, one of the ways is to look at these patterns. Oops, here we go. So this is where I work and I have a lot of fun with, is that the innovation stage is really hidden. Now if you're a company and you want to know what you should be investing in, or you're a buyer and you want to know whether what you're investing in is going to last very long, I'm looking at what's coming next that's under this radar, that's in the hidden area. And that's one of the things I, that I work on. But it's not just technology. There's at least three different innovation curves that occur. The first one is a technology innovation curve. Where we, where we take uh, <coughs> this axis to be sort of the amount of innovation that's happening. It, it certainly goes up and then it peaks and then there's less and less innovation. But there's also an applications curve. So, and that makes sense, you know, you're really not going to develop uses for the iPod before the iPod's developed, if you think about it. So the technology comes first, then we start thinking of the uses for it, applications, processes. And then after that, the third area is we start to look at, okay, can we bundle together stuff and now make money off services to those people who have these products. So there's three different curves of innovation that happen one after the other. And some companies then take the whole thing. They'll sell you the product, they'll sell you the applications, and they'll give you the services all as a bundle called solutions. I'm sure in hearing about marketing, you've heard the word solutions. That's another stage of where a field is at. So everybody familiar with learning management systems? If you're in training at all, you should know about them. This is basically where I put learning management <laughs> systems on these three curves. I think the, the innovation on the technology side is pretty well finished. I don't think there's many new things I've seen in the last five years. And applications, well, we know what to do with them. We pretty well put every fe feature we can think of into the learning management systems. So mostly it's about services. So it's posting, for example, posting learning management systems or other ways of taking it off the backs of uh, outsourcing, taking it off the backs of the corporate people and putting it somewhere else as a service package. So that's where we are, and that's a fairly far down the road in terms of maturity of a technology. So where's mobile learning? I think it's here. And I'm doing this to say, okay, the future depends on this process, and this is going to move along. But right now, I actually think that we're not quite there for innovations, technology innovations, but we're starting to slow down. I think a lot of the main technical innovations are there to do mobile learning. They weren't there 10 years ago when we were talking about it first. Things were too small, they, were too, they weren't powerful enough, there was no infrastructure. A lot of that stuff's now been built. Now there's a few incremental innovations that are happening, but really, we're starting an application screen. So the real news is if you're a developer, you should be developing applications for mobile learning. There's not enough of an industry out there to even worry about services. So if you're going to look at the future in the next three to five years, this bar is going to move along here. At least that's how I see it in terms of the theory. <coughs> 